Ready? Ready to go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Shear, the Prez 98, and I am not Johnny Long. He's over there. But sometimes you get put up against the speaker like Johnny Long, and you figure, well, what do you do about that? Well, you don't do anything about that, and you, you be absolutely happy that 40 or so of you decided to come here instead of there. So thank you. You could. <laughs> you could, and that would suck, but you know. So I'm going to talk about um, um, political activism in the hacker community. And I'll be explicit um, that I'm talking about the United States here. So um, some of this would apply outside of the country, but the stuff I'm going to talk about is purpose to the United States. So. I'm going, to let, I'm going to just post this quote up here and let you stew on it, and then eventually we'll get to talking about it more in specifics. Um, but this is a quote that I heard recently, um, and, and we will get to that. Um, so under certain circumstances, DDoS, or D Distributed Denial of Service, is protected political speech and should be afforded First Amendment protection. So you can think about whether or not you agree with that or not, and I'll get to sort of we'll get to that specifically. So this is who I am, lead associate, senior penetration tester uh, at Booz Allen. Some of you know that I worked at Booz Allen previously and I left to go out on my own. Um, and uh, I decided to go back to school, so I'm a law student now at uh, University of the District of Columbia. And um, I didn't want to worry about running my own business and going to school at the same time, so I went back to Booz Allen. So I was also a Navy veteran and did a whole bunch of stuff in Iraq. So. This is a slide that I always include, a title slide that I always include in my talks. And so speakers will often tell you why you should listen to them, because they're an expert, because, you know, whatever. I always like to say why you should be skeptical of the things I say, right? So first of all, I'm not a lawyer, but yet. So that's like the new thing now. You all see A, I, A, N, A, L all the time. Like, I'm not a lawyer, but, but now with the why, that's my, that's my thing. I made that. Um, so this presentation is both unintentionally and intentionally, you know, sort of biased by my own beliefs. So some stuff I intentionally put in here to be provocative or whatever, and some of it is just the way I am, and I may not even realize that I did it, so realize that. This is also by far the most political presentation I've, all, I've given in, my, in, in all of my talks. And I'm very, I'm very closer, sure. So I, I'm very, you know, careful about talking about politics because, you know, as we'll get to, this community is not always very political, and it's, you know, it's very easy to like turn half the people off because what you say you don't necessarily agree with. So it's a political presentation, but it's not about politics itself. So um, I don't care you're Republican, Democrat, Green Party, whatever. It doesn't matter, and where you stand on the issues really doesn't matter for the sake of this presentation. Um, so this presentation is more about process than results. So you may, we'll talk about the process, and you may get to a different result than I do, and that's fine. Um, so I say, just don't take my word for it. Figure it out on your own. This is just kind of throwing my stuff out there. Um, so let's try to define a few things before we move on. Um, politics, well, what is it? So I don't know. There's no. There's public policy issues, uh, who knows? Um, let me tell you like sort of my default position. Um, so I will refer to some political issues in this presentation and I refer to them not to, you know, so later on I'm gonna talk like for about 30 seconds about Obamacare. And it's not gonna be because I'm for or against it, but I wanna use it as a, an example to show what I'm talking about. So most of you will know um, that I'm pretty conservative. I've been a Republican my entire life. Um, in the past five years, I've become very, uh, considerably more libertarian. And I would register as a libertarian in Maryland, but they don't let you register as a libertarian in Maryland, so I can't. Um, so, but here, so let me, let me frame it in this way. Regardless of the outcome of the issue, the way, the way I'm gonna look at an issue for this presentation is more freedom is almost always better to less freedom. Okay, so that's where we're gonna start from. Activism. Hacktivism. So, for the purposes of this presentation only, 
just so we don't, so we're, so we're clear. When I say activism, I'm referring to acts that would otherwise be considered legal acts. So work, more or less working within the system. And when I say hacktivism, I want to define that very narrowly to be illegal hacktivism, right? So acts that you could get arrested for. Like, for example, DDoS. You could get arrested for DDoS. Whether or not you think it's free speech or not, you could get arrested for it. So for the purposes of this presentation, hacktivism will define it very narrowly to be an illegal act. So here's some other issues just to stew over for the purposes of this. Um, you know, where's the line between legal and illegal? And this is where we get into some of these issues. Should, we, should it move or does it really matter? Who knows? Do the ends justify the means? So does it, if we want to get from A to B, does it matter how we get there, right? Or does it not matter? Does the process by which we get from A to B matter? So every decision has costs and benefits, and we need to weigh them. If the costs outweigh the benefits, then maybe that's not the way to do it. OK. So th uh, this is how I see sort of the status quo of the hacker community. You can feel free to disagree. I think the hacker community, in large part, is you know, sort of apolitical. They don't talk about politics a lot. Um, there's some exceptions. How many being hope? I mean, it's pretty political, right? Um, there's, there might be other places. Um, and the only time that we really seem to get fired up is, you know, sort of the, the SOPA PIPA debate of last year, where like the whole community sort of rose up, and Google and Wikipedia and everyone else sort of said no, you know. So that was, we 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 coalesced or around those issues, maybe some a little bit less for like net neutrality. But other than those sort of technical issues, we just sort of say it's there. We don't really want to get into politics because we don't want to be divisive, you know, that sort of thing. Although I think, I think things are starting to change a little bit. So in the past couple of years, we've seen some of these issues, uh, privacy issues, um, net neutrality, um, that sort of thing. And, and these issues are starting to invade the things that we talk about all the time. Um, the InfoSec disclosure debate is an old debate, really. We've been talking about that forever. Uh, but we'll talk about in a little bit how that sort of disclosure debate has now moved into other areas and, and, and it's new to them. So is this good or bad? I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's, I think it's, it's happening, so I think we ought to think about it. So this is sort of where I want to go. It's my opinion. I think it's inevitable that we're going in this direction, so I think we need to figure out a way to look at these issues and not say, well, the Republicans think this, so that's my position, or the Democrats think this, so that's my position. Let's look at it a little bit differently um, and figure out. So what I'm asking of you and, and, and me, so, well, this, groups like the EFF are sort of already doing this. You know, they're, um, if you go to the EFF and you go to their issues, they talk about a lot, of, a lot more stuff than we often hear about. Um, they're already sort of out there in the trenches doing a lot of stuff. So I'm saying, you know, let's embrace those things and, 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 and push, that, push that agenda along. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them on everything. Um, I don't think this is really a radical change, although I think it is sort of a, there's, I think we have a sort of a mental block to, to getting involved in this sort of thing. And then what are the costs and benefits of doing that? You know, if, if we start taking positions on issues, then, you know, you, we are going to turn some people off to, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, let's talk about some individual issues. This is my favorite quote. So I talked about, does, do the ends justify the means? Does, if we can get from A to B, then, so I need a car. That's, that's my B, right? I need a car. And I'm at A, I don't have a car. So what ways can I get a car? Well, I can go buy a car. Um, I could borrow someone's car. I could just say, hey, can I borrow your car? Um, I could steal a car, right? Or I could, you know, go rob a bank and then buy the car for that money. I mean, all these ways get me from A to B. But how, how many of them are really okay? Well, really, only the legal ones are probably okay. So this is a quote from Jeremy Hammond, uh, which we'll talk about him through sort of throughout the presentation. He's a, you know, activist hacktivist, whatever you want to call him. Um, and this was a quote that he gave at DEF CON 12 prior to the Republican National Convention. He said, any method of disruption at any cost, any means necessary. So I think, his, I think it's safe to say that his sort of thing is, you know, the ends justify the means, right? If, to get from A to B, we can do whatever we need to do to get there. 
So let's talk first about the First Amendment, free speech. I'm not going to read it to you. You've seen it before. Free speech. Let's be clear that when we're talking about free speech, the First Amendment applies to the government. So if I prevent you from speaking, I, that's not an infringement of your free speech because I'm not the government. However, that sort of the idea here is we're talking about free expression, expression of free expression of ideas. So we saw this quote on the second slide. Under certain circumstances, DDoS is protected political speech and should be afforded First Amendment protection. This is Jay, uh, Jay Lederman, who is an attorney, and he was on the anon anonymous panel at DEF CON 20. And not surprising that he would make this statement because some of his clients are people who were um, anonymous activists who participated in DDoS attacks. So obviously he's defending them and that's his argument. So how many people, how many of you would generally agree with this statement? DDoS should be protected political speech. Maybe anybody? A couple, okay, fair enough. I mean, it's, it's certainly controversial. It's certainly controversial. So what about when we get to someone like the jester, right? How many have heard of the jester? Well, most of you, yeah? So does it matter? So if it's something we don't like, we can easily, you know, if it's the Westboro Baptist, we can say like, well, you know, we don't really like them. What if it's something that's sort of, that we like or something good? Does it matter if the reason is a good one? Does it matter if uh, the jester is DDoSing or is DOSing, you know, some, you know, Arabic, whatever site um, that, that people consider him a patriot or that he's on our side or that the other side is outside the United States. So whatever he does is okay because he's not really preventing Americans from speaking. Fair enough question. Let me tell you what I think. You can just, again, you can decide to agree or disagree. I think Personally, I think that, that muzzling speech of others is never an acceptable use of the First Amendment. Never. So, and I think that participating in de distributed denial of service or denial of service is basically admitting that you fail in, you know, the marketplace of ideas, you know. So this comes down to, you know, like I said, I think more freedom is almost always preferable to less freedom. So I think more speech is better than less speech. I think, I think DDoS, so here, so what is DDoS? I mean, how does that come to speech? I think this is like going to a protest, right? And you're, you sort of do the whole Agent Smith thing on Neo. Remember at the interrogation where he basically, he closes his mouth and he can't talk? And he's like, I think that's basically what you're doing when you DDoS somebody, personally. I think it's, I think it's essentially censorship. So that means, to, that means, you know, we can't apply, we can't say, well, this guy's doing it for a good reason, so it's okay. I think it's always a bad reason, personally. Okay, so we talked about the InfoSec disclosure debate. And we've been talking about that for a decade, longer, more than that, 20 years. Well, how about this one? Um, there were two papers written on the H H5N1 flu. And the National Science Advisory Board said, uh, we don't really want to publish these papers because somebody might figure out the bad stuff you're talking about and do it on their own. Does this sound familiar? The board said this is an unprecedented recommendation, but we want to censor you. So think about this. This is an issue that, now this is sort of the backwards of what we're talking about here. This is an issue that we've dealt with many times. Now it's pushing out into public policy issues. A government advisory body basically said we want to censor what you're going to publish. One of the studies eventually published later with, they made some revisions to it, but think about that. So we talked about the analysis to the InfoSec disclosure debate. How about this? In February 2008, PayPal went to one of its um, uh, people that use its services called Smash, anybody hear Smashwords before? Smashwords is like a way that you can publish your own books. You know, there's a many, many of these places out there, but you, you, you basically can publish your own stuff, you know, really cheaply. And uh, e-books, by the way. And PayPal was, was the way that people used e um, Smashwords. And PayPal said, well, if we don't really like the content of what's in these books, we're not gonna, we're not gonna let you use PayPal. So PayPal was effectively censoring people's content. 
So it wasn't government censorship, but it is sort of legal censorship, right? What? We have to think about how that, does that promote self-censorship? If I'm, say I write a, uh, on a provocative topic and I know that PayPal is gonna say no to my book. What do they, first of all, they have nothing to do with the book itself. Does that, is that gonna change how I write or what I write about because they might, may or may not publish it? So does it have a chilling effect on, on what people express their ideas? So there was a lot of pushback from the EFF and others, and they eventually revised their policy. Um, originally, their policy was just sort of obscene content. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, and they really wanted to focus on like child pornography, but their definition was so broad that it included a whole bunch of other things. And now we return to Jeremy Hammond. Uh, so if, if you wanna see this speech in its entirety, it's pretty interesting. Um, I'll give you the link later. It's just, it's on my YouTube page, so youtube.com slash thepres98. It's called Electronic Civil Disobedience in the Re Republican National Convention. And uh, I'll just give you a, br a few brief highlights. He gave the quote that I talked about earlier, sort of all means necessary. Um, he basically um, rambled on stage. There was a lot of booing and hissing. And at one point, uh, halfway through the speech, pre you know, all know Priest, who's the one, one of the head security goons at DEF CON, actually came onto the stage, interrupted the talk, uh, and basically said, because Jeremy had been calling for like violent acts and things like this, and Priest basically interrupted the speech and said, no, we're not doing this. Uh, and then he later had to be sort of escorted off the stage because people were getting very mad and angry at some of the stuff he was saying. So. That's our little sort of brief history of Jeremy Hammond. And we'll, again, we'll get back to him again because he shows up again. So, for, so we talked a little bit about free, free expression. Let's talk about privacy. Pri there's, you won't find the word privacy in the Constitution. It's not there. But we, we sort of have some privacy issues coming from the Fourth Amendment. So Fourth Amendment's up here. I highlight the word unreasonable because um, you will see that the word reasonable or unreasonable is written into like so many different laws and it's the most litigated word in the English language. It just comes up, is this reasonable? Net neutrality all comes down to what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. So you will see that a lot. And again, Fourth Amendment has to do with, with privacy against government intrusion. If I come and knock down your door, you can't say that I violated your Fourth Amendment rights because I'm of the government. I violated your privacy, but not your Fourth Amendment. So the, the whole concept of, of the Fourth Amendment is the reasonable expectation of privacy. And it's a calculation, right? So there's two things, an actual expectation of privacy, and which is sort of a uh, what you think, and then the expectation is reasonable to other people. So it's kind of a circular reasoning, but let me give you an example. You go into a phone booth, and a public phone booth, and you close the door to the phone booth, which we don't only have those phone booths anymore, but we used to, and you sort of hold your hand over the, over the, mouth, or the mouthpiece and you talk. So the question would be, you know, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your communications? And the courts would say yes, because you, know, you closed the door, you lowered your voice, you covered your mouth, but if you were out in the middle of a park and screaming out loud, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, you know, so that sort of thing. But the, the important point to see here is that these are variables. Both of these things are variables. If I publish your social security number on the internet, that's not free speech because it's your private information, right? And the more times that you see private information, it becomes less private and less private. So the argument here it would, would talk about the costs and benefits of, for example, posting information about security breaches. So XYZ Group breaks into Texas Sheriff Department website and posts all their addresses on the internet, right? So what are we talking about here? We're talking about releasing pri people's private information. When private information is not private anymore, then that changes the reasonable expectation of privacy. So the, the problem here is that the benefit might be, okay, we exposed this security flaw. The cost is that we're changing people's expectation of privacy. We're actually losing Fourth Amendment protection every time someone does this. So that's the cost. Is the benefit versus the cost worth it? 
I'm going to talk about this very briefly, but I want to expand on it in a, in a, in a, in a follow-on talk. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about civil forfeiture and why this is really something that is, is beginning to intrude on our community. So the concept of civil forfeiture is um, this really exploded in the 1980s in the drug wars, and this is basically seizing sort of the assets of people that are being used for drugs. So your car, people's car, the boat, all this stuff, and then the government would just either use it or sell it. Or, so the problem here is, so that, is that the person who owns the thing, let's say you own a boat, right? And I'm the government, and I suspect that you're using the boat to traffic in drugs. So civil forfeiture, I actually sue the boat, not you. So this is sort of weird, right? So I sue the boat, and you're a third party. So you have sort of an interest in it, but you have to. Now, I can seize it with, with a court order, but then you have to prove that that boat was not being used in drugs. So you see what's, what's wrong here? The presumption to, of, of innocence has completely flopped, and now you are required to prove something to get it back. So that's a little bit weird for our system of law, right? We expect a presumption of innocence. Well, this is sort of flipping in the lens back. And so this is sort of how the government is doing domain takedowns. So the domain is property, right? It's, it's not the same as a boat, but it's property. So the government can just go to the court and say, well, this domain's being used in, you know, whatever, and they seize it, right? They're not really seizing the content, they're seizing the, na the domain name. Um, and you want, so you might want to be wondered to ask, well, what happens if this is some, you know, sports site in Spain that shows the Super Bowl, right? Well, the problem is if, if it's a .com or a .net or a .org, all those registrars are located in the United States. So the property is in the United States. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is, and I'll, I, this is sort of what I want to talk about in one of my next talks, is about sort of Microsoft's botnet takedowns where you run a small ass ISP, right? And you get a knock on the door, and it's not the US government, but it's Microsoft. And there might be a US Marshal with them, but it's Microsoft. The US Marshal is just there to help enforce a private civil action, and they're gonna come into your ISP and take your servers, and like, what the hell is that all about, you know? A procedure which even Microsoft says is constitutionally suspect, so. Copyrights and patents. Uh, I'm not going to talk about D DMCA. You, you all know that. Uh, there was a case in the Supreme Court this past session, Golan v. Holder, and um, I'm not going to go into it in detail other than to say that the Supreme Court in Golan v. Holder said that materials that have been released to the public domain, so public domain, can be later given copyright protection. Does that make any sense at all? No, but that's what they said. So there's a whole bunch of material that was, that had been, copyright protection had, had ended. And then the United States signed a intellectual property treaty and a lot of that stuff got put back into copyright protection. And people are like, whoa, what the heck? That doesn't make any sense. But it's, that happened. And I'm not gonna talk about patent trolls because it's sort of a, and it's just going on. Next topic, licensing laws. How many of you live in a state where you have to be licensed to be maybe a locksmith? Locksmith, so there's some out there. So let's talk about the purpose of, locks, of licensing laws in the first place. Well, what is the purpose? Well, okay, in some of these cases, you know, you might say, well, I wanna make sure that the doctor that I'm going to is not a fraud, right? He's not some guy from, that went to some like fake school and mailed in his diploma and you know, okay, so there might be some legitimate reasons for that. Well, what about like, so in, in, in Maryland, we have a very pretty stringent law to be a private investigator. Like you have to be, you have to work for someone else for five years to pay these like ex exorbitant licensing fees. Well, why? Is, do they really want to make sure that the private investigator you're hiring is legitimate? 
Not really. Uh, the case is that in the 1950s, when the private investigator laws were, licensing laws were written, they were basically written by the private investigators to keep everyone out so they would have the business to themselves. So they created a high barrier of entry for everyone else. So we talked about doctors, maybe lawyers. I mean, there's certainly some instances where licensing laws are good. Well, what about, you know, really a masseuse? A lot of states require like 500 hours to be a masseuse. Okay, I mean, maybe there's a good reason for it, but let's, we have to know, also think about licensing laws. Why are they there? If they're there just to keep other people out so that the people who are already doing it can profit and, and not have to worry about competition, then maybe that's not such a good idea. So I wanna talk about um, sort of the current world, the way that we sort of look at things, not just me, but the way that we as society look at issues and they may turn it on its head. So our current worldview is, is sort of this. We've got this massive government, right? Regardless of your view on government, but the government is massive. We spend massive amounts of money and we kind of say that, okay, the, everything's out there and every, every, we have a little islands here and there where we have things we can do. Free speech, that's over here. Um, Fourth Amendment, privacy, that's over here. And, you know, whatever. We have all these little islands, and as long as we're on one of those islands, we're okay, but let's try to stay out of the rest of the, of the sea. Um, so I asked this question before in a previous talk. Do you have the right to wear a red hat on Wednesday? Well, you can look in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and you're not gonna see anything about hats, right? Nothing about Wednesdays, nothing about, so why are, why, so should you be able to wear a red hat on Wednesdays, right? I mean, we can argue whether or not it's sort of free expression, whether it falls under free speech, but there's nothing in the Constitution about free speech or about red hats. I would argue that sort of where we, when we ask the question this way, it's fundamentally the wrong way of asking the question, right? And I'll get to the answer on the next slide. And this is, and this next point is we're gonna talk about just for the sake of, of, of this example, the Obamacare. So the Supreme Court said that Obamacare, or the individual mandate was not uh, constitutional under the Commerce Clause. Okay, however, if we consider it to be a tax, it is constitutional. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into that other than just say, the, the, sort of the way we look at issues is that if a law can be found to be constitutional, even if it's not the way that the writers intended, then we'll say it's constitutional. So the president said it's not a tax, the Congress said it's not a tax, they specifically said it's not a tax. But the court said, well, if we look at it like a tax, it's okay. So that's how the courts operate. If you can figure out a way to make it constitutional, even if it's not the way that they wanted, then it's okay. That's, that's just the way that the courts work now. And that wasn't supposed to happen. So I think we need to take all of that and flip it on its head, right? So we shouldn't, it shouldn't necessarily be, well, we're on this island here, so we have free speech. We're here, let's, let's flip it. Let's say that, well, what about, let's ask the question differently. Um, should it really be, can I wear a red hat on Wednesdays? Or should it be, can the government prevent me from wearing a red hat on Wednesdays? And clearly, there's nothing in the Constitution that allows the government to do that, right? So flip the question, shift the burden from the, from the person to prove the issue to the government. So the presumption here is not that anything's constitutional. The presumption is that, the presumption is liberty. So anything that restricts that ought to be proven by someone else, not me. So this is sort of a healthy skepticism, right? Some questions that you think about regarding any law. Does the law actually accomplish what it's intended to do, right? Is it a short-term solution or a long-term solution? We're, we are, so we're really good at these things right now. We're really good at good intentions, right? We're really good at good intentions. We're good at short-term solutions. We're good at uh, solutions that, that benefit this little group over here and may not screw everybody else, but you know, sort of it helps this group. And we're good at you know, making good things happen for X, Y, or Z, but not A, B, or C. So, Think about these questions when you see a, uh, uh, an issue. 
we can, and this quote on the bottom sort of exemplifies this. We, we really ought to think about, when we're going to judge whether a law is good or not, um, think about not the intentions, because the intentions don't really matter. The results are the only thing that really matters. OK, I'm not going to read this. Um, how many, anybody from Massachusetts? Anybody? No? Not at all? OK, there's a Senate candidate in Massachusetts named Elizabeth Warren. And she gave this speech about um, sort of a justification for taxation and fair taxation. I, I'm not going to I don't really care about the policy implications of it, um, except at the end, she said this, part of the underlying social contract is that you take a hunk of that and pay it forward for the next kid who comes along. So we're going to talk about social contract very briefly. Talk a little bit about some philosophical issues. What is a social contract, right? Um, how many of you signed a social contract with the government? Anybody in the room? I don't think so. So 56 people signed a social contract, and those people were all dead, but they signed the Declaration of Independence, which was sort of a social contract. A social contract is an agreement between you and the government that basically says, I'm going to give up some of my rights to the government to give you the authority to be in charge to protect my rights. That's what a social contract is. We, 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 however, we need to be, none of us signed that, right? So it's sort of like assumed. We need to be very careful about when we talk about what people's obligations are under social contract theory because there's a whole bunch of different things you could say are in the social contract. But again, none of us actually signed anything. These next issues I want to talk a little bit about government power. So let's assume for the sake of this presentation, we all agree that anything that's in this box is something the government can do. We agree that the government can do it. Now, we could also say there's things that are outside that, you know, we can argue about where the boundaries is, but let's assume we have this. So right now, we basically stop at this point. If it's in the box, it's OK. If it's outside the box, it's not OK. And sometimes we don't even go that far. But this is sort of the, the, the most elementary level that we get to. However, we need to be better than that, right? So we know that the Constitution, um, the way that the Constitution is set up, uh, we have three levels of government, federal, state, local. We need to be careful about what happens if the federal government does something that the states are supposed to do, or what happens if the states do something that the federal government's supposed to do. You know, we can have the greatest law, but if it violates one of these federalism issues, then we need to be, we need to be willing to say no. But we need to go even one step further. We know that the Constitution pres pres prescribes the separation of powers, legislative, executive, judicial branch. If something, if the legislature tries to do something that the executive branch is supposed to do, even if it's a good idea, we ought to say no. If the executive branch, and here's a great example, the FCC, which is an executive agency, rolled out net neutrality rules, which it did not have authority to do from Congress. They were, out, they were acting outside of their box of power. So we ought to, even if we think net neutrality is a good idea, we ought to say, you got to do it the right way. So we talked about, sort of, sort of throughout this talk about process. It's important about how we get from A to B. The process is, and so the process is more important necessary, or, than the substance. And you may say, well, OK, I looked at it the way you did, and I came out to a different conclusion. Absolutely, fine. No reason. I, I don't care what your what your B is, as long as you as long as we start looking at issues this way. I think it's a better a better way. So, illegal hacktivism, right? Not. I mean, they, let's be clear. So we talked about Jeremy Hammond, right? So, let's talk about costs and benefits. What are the benefits of things that Jeremy Hammond has done? Why? Well, it's it's hard to measure, you know, but he's been out there doing activist stuff, you know. What are the costs? Well, in the past 10 years, Jeremy Hammond's been arrested at least a dozen times. He spent 18 months in federal prison. He's currently in prison for, um, I don't know if it was the Strat for one of the recent hacks. He was turned in by this guy, Sabu, who was also apprehended by the FBI, and then they turned him um, to go against other people. So, and he turned, most people believe he turned because of his relationship with his daughter. He didn't want to go to jail because he's, you know, he's got a daughter. So the costs are mounting here, right? I mean, you're putting your personal liberty at stake to, for something. 
uh, some other LulzSec guy. All these, there's so many more, but these are just a few examples of some of the people that have been arrested and or charged with, with DDoS or other attack. And this, this guy on the bottom, this guy, one of these guys almost looks like Dave Marcus, but I have a good authority that's not actually Dave Marcus. The one on like the, the second to bottom row, the third one, I mean, it sort of looks like him a little bit, but it's not, I, I promise it's not. So these are just some of the people that have been arrested. So these are costs, right? These people went, are going to prison or at least going to be charged. They're going to have to hire lawyers like, like Liederman and they're going to have to figure out, you know, how, whether or not the benefits of what they did, you know, DDoSing PayPal or whatever was a good idea and whether the price they paid was worth it. Um, and we have to think about what is, the, what, is the, what is the benefit of what they've done and what's the cost of it. They're, they're paying a personal cost. They're going to jail. Well, what about our costs? Are there costs on us? And I would say yes. I would say that when they do something, well, somebody in Congress says, well, we need to pass a, a law to prevent them from doing this, this, and this. They mean, the law becomes tougher. We can argue about whether or not the penalties for these crimes are worth it or not, and sometimes they may be excessive, but that's what it is. And so think about that. Those are, there's a lot, of, there's a very high social cost to what all these people are doing. And there, there might be a benefit too, but there's a very high cost. Of course, they're all innocent until proven guilty. If you ever learned anything from watching cops, that, that's, that's true. Except if it's a civil forfeiture, then you're not innocent. So let's go to sort of working within the system, legal, legal methods. Well, we saw in, um, we saw in, with Google and Wikipedia and the sort of SOAP and PIPA thing where the whole community sort of said, you know what, no, F no, we're not gonna do this. So a really good example of where working mostly within the system, and there were people working outside the system, but I would say working mostly, mostly within the system worked. How many have heard of TestPack? Anybody? So TestPack was set up on Reddit, and it was a bunch of people who were, um, decided that they want to set up a political action committee to talk about, um, or to sort of f donate money to candidates who they supported. Um, well, TestPack, TestPAC's opponent was uh, Lamar, Lamar Smith, who's a Republican from Texas, who was one of the authors, I think, of one of the cybersecurity bills. I don't know if it was SOAP or, SOAP or PIP, one of these bills. And they collected money, a few $7,000 or something like that, and they put up a billboard. And well, it didn't turn out so well. So re re Lamar Smith's district is very Republican. They, they were sort of going after his opponents in the primary. Uh, or supporting his opponents in the primary, you know, entrenched Republican district, more or less just threw their money at a wasted cause. You know, not, not to say that it wasn't a good idea, but you have to pick the right fights, right? And they didn't pick a very good fight. So just working with the system doesn't always mean it's a good idea or that it works out. You know, this is a case where it didn't work out the way they wanted. Hopefully the next step they do will be something better. This is a smart meter. Um, we have uh, in Maryland, about a year ago, the, law, the, the, the sort of prevailing view in Maryland was that when they come to your house, um, they are gonna install a smart meter and there's nothing you could do about it. So myself and a few other people, some people who were maybe a little bit on the fringe in terms of their views, said, you know what, we, we would like at least, at least an option to say no. We don't, I don't want the smart meter. And um, for those of you who do live in, um, in Maryland or other, st other states that do this too, so say there's a bill to do something, X, Y, Z. So a uh, legislator in Maryland uh, wrote a bill that said the utility companies should allow um, people to opt out, to basically just say, I don't want a meter. Well, in Maryland, you can just go to the state legislature when they're gonna, the day that they're going to discuss the bill and you sign your name on the piece of paper and they let you speak, like in front of the committee who's, who's going to vote on the bill. It's really cool. So I went and did that and there was a whole bunch of other people who did that and the committee voted uh, 23 to zero against us. So we were like, okay, whatever. However, the Maryland Public Service Commission about a few months ago, you know what, said, no, that's a good idea. And now the rule in Maryland is that you can, put up, you can tell the 
BGE or the utility company? No, I don't want a smart meter, and they can't put it on your house. So we do have the option now. So I didn't have to DDoS anybody to do that, right? I mean, I actually worked, it wasn't just me, it was other people too, but we worked within the system and we said, we, we gave ourselves an option. So just an example, sometimes things work out the way we want, sometimes they don't. So what things can we do? We always say this, vote, go vote, right? Well, you know, sometimes a lot of people just don't vote. There, there are cases, especially in local elections, where, where, where issues come down to you know, a handful of votes. And honestly, whether, whether Romney or Obama wins is probably res, less relevant to every, your everyday life than who your city councilman is or who your town you know, councilor is or those really local elections, because those are the people who are going to mess with your everyday life. Whether we have Romney or Obama, we can argue about that, but I think the local elections are really important to you. Um, and then you say, oh, I don't really like the choices, right? I don't want to vote for Romney or Obama. Well, that's a little late to run for president, but for maybe for some of these local elections, maybe it ought to be you. Why not? Why can't you be the candidate? There's a lot of things you can do. Participate online, write letters, testify like I did, speak out. You can even occupy if you want. I don't care. As long as you're doing it legally, go for it. You know? We didn't, I didn't talk about occupy really at all in this presentation, but to the extent that, the, the, that they're operating within the law, hey, go for it. Putting up tents, maybe you know, crossing the line, but you know. So educate yourself. There's a lot of bad news out there, right? If, if the only source you get your news from is Fox News, or, on the other side, if, if the only news you get your news from is MSNBC, you're doing it wrong. Really, you are, okay? That's not to say that Fox News doesn't do some good journalism or that MSNBC doesn't do some good journalism, but really, sorry. Broaden the scope of what you're looking at, right? I like to read articles from three or four different sources that are on the same issue and look at how they work. Identify good sources and bad sources. Any of you are all familiar with RT, like RT.com used to be Russia Today? This is, the only, this is the only sort of source that I'll talk about. They're terrible. Their headlines are sort of link bait, and they don't, talk, they don't actually talk about those things in the articles, and their, their analysis of stuff is really bad. So don't rely on other people to tell you what's in the bill or what's in the law. Go read it for yourself, right? So there's this site called Open Congress. There's a whole bunch of sites that have legislation out there, right? But Open Congress allows you to go, like, mouse over an individual section of the law and you can comment on it and you see what other people are saying about it. So this is a section of the National Defense Authorization Act that talked about indefinite detention. This is really controversial when it passed. And I went to this open Congress site and I was the only person who made a comment on it. Like no one else had even said anything. And I basically said this, this, was in, this, this part of the law was found unconstitutional. Like, really important, but no, people aren't even, you know, oh, they just say they don't care about it. Well, go read what it says and see what other people are saying and, you know, educate yourself. Don't rely on what someone else says, even me. Five minutes. So what else can you do? You got to educate other people that what they're doing is, 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 your, is their rights or your rights and vice versa, right? So, um... Let's go, let's go to a real controversial one, Westboro Baptist Church. Westboro Baptist Church is, from a legal standpoint, they're very smart. They have legally educated people working for them, and they push the limit of the law, but they only go right to the limit. They don't go over it, right? There was a case that went to the Supreme Court last semester, or two years ago, and the Supreme Court said, you know what, they're allowed to protest at funerals as long as they're a certain distance away and whatever, you know. What they're doing may be absolutely reprehensible. We disagree with it, you know, everything they say. However, they're doing it within the law. We need to be able to stand up and say, as much as I hate the Westboro Baptist Church, their free speech is as important as mine. Because if you take theirs away, they're not going to be there to protect yours, right? Their right is our right. It's the same thing. Controversial, but that's, you know, that's where I come down. The video, so two videos that I talked about, the Jeremy Hammond video 
and the anonymous panel at DEF CON. I have them both on my YouTube, so youtube.com slash pres98. These slides will be at, they're not there now, but they will be, scribe.com, the pres98. There's my Twitter, the pres98. And that's all I've got for you. Thank you. <laughs> got about three minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions. Sure. Well, I mean, sure, but sure, but you. There, it depends on the case. So there are certain circumstances where DDoS can be charged under a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is damaging computers. So just the act of DDoS. I mean, there's no DDoS law, but that's what you're right. They're being charged under a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986. You know, in 1986, we didn't really know what a DDoS was, so we couldn't write it into the law. So therein lies one of the issues. These laws need to be updated. And some 70-year-old judge, what does he really know about DDoS? He might not know. So he's really relying on what the government says. The government says they damaged a computer. And maybe they did damage a computer. But you know, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying that the, all these issues are black and white, because they are certainly not. However, you know, as the law is currently written and as it's interpreted, if you do that, you're going to get arrested. You potentially get arrested. Sure. So, I mean, I think that everybody knows, I think there are very few people who, except for like the really stupid ones that you showed on the anonymous slide at the bottom <laughs> section, that, that don't know that what they're doing sure. is legal. They're just trying to tell the yeah. Well, and I think, I would agree with that. And, and I would think even many of those people know it. I mean, Jeremy Hammond certainly knows what he's doing is illegal, right? He's been arrested enough times to, to figure that out, I hope. Um, you know, so it's just a matter of, you know, but yeah, you, you, it's a good point. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's certainly not easy to do, you know, it's it's an uphill battle, um, but it doesn't mean it can't be done either, or that we shouldn't fight the fight. But right, absolutely, that's a good point. Anybody else? Yeah. Or, or it could be that too. It could be. It could be like uh, the. I don't think. So. I think intent has a lot to do with it, right? I don't know. I don't think sending an email as part of. No, I wouldn't. I mean, it may be considered that, but I'm talking about like using a a DDoS tool where you're allow maybe allowing your computer to be used as, as an attack, as an attacker. But you raise a good point. All right, thank you.